Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode 6 of my series on the Cathar Crusade, The Hounds of God. As I explained in episode 5, the Fourth Lateran Council had legitimized Simon de Montfort's conquest of most of the Landoc region under the cover of the Cathar Crusade, even though he had not burned any Cathars in years. However, his harsh rule was resented by the residents of cities like Marseille, Avignon, and Tarascon who treasured their hard-won independence. Therefore, they rallied to Count Raymond's son Raymond, who proved to be a better warrior than his father. Actually, Count Raymond brought an army of nobles dispossessed by the Northern Crusaders to Toulouse, which had revolted against Montfort. Joined by his son, the two Raymonds led their army and the citizens to hold out against the Crusaders during a brutal siege that lasted for months until Montfort finally received his just reward when a stone from a Maginelle smashed his helmet and his head to pulp. With the death of Simon de Montfort, the main leader of the crusade, it seemed possible that the people of the Landoc would finally know peace. It is worth pointing out that unlike the later religious wars, where people gleefully slaughtered each other over minor differences of religious interpretation, the Cathars were non-violent and never killed anyone. The actual resistance was essentially self-defense by locals against northern invaders who used the crusade as an excuse for a land grab. Although he had viewed the crusade as a sideshow, Pope Honorius could not accept the defeat of a crusade so nearby, therefore he proclaimed a new crusade. Unfortunately, neither King Philip of France nor his son Louis expressed any interest in leading the crusade. Following his epic victory during the Battle of Bouvin against the coalition of the Emperor of Germany and the Counts of Flanders, Boulogne, and Brabant, Philip had become the dominant power in Europe and was busy expanding his control into Flanders, Anjou, and Brittany. Until papal legate Bertrand offered leadership of the crusade to Count Theobald of Champagne. Since Theobald had a claim to the throne of Navarre, Philip saw a little benefit in one of his most powerful vassals taking a leadership role in a region where he would have many opportunities to expand his territory. So Philip suddenly discovered a fervent hatred of heresy, and Louis was pushed into taking the cross by his father on November 20th. After organizing his army during the winter and the spring, Louis arrived at the siege of Marmande in early June. Aside from 20 bishops and an uncountable number of monks, his army had 30 barons, 200 knights, and 10,000 foot soldiers. Faced with such a huge army, resistance was futile, so the commander of the garrison surrendered to avoid the destruction of the town. Unfortunately, his nightmare came true anyway. The exact details are unclear, but it appears that French crusaders started looting while the terms of surrender were being discussed, the situation grew out of control, and the entire population of 7,000 was massacred. Possibly Amaré de Montfort and his followers wanted revenge for previous defeats? It seems unlikely that Louis would have ordered a massacre since he had always treated captured enemies fairly. Unlike Montfort, Louis had more than enough men to besiege Toulouse when he arrived on June 16th. Even so, the southerners decided to resist. The massacre at Marmand ended any hopes of negotiated surrender. They had spent the past year rebuilding their defenses, and they hoped that the Crusader army would start to disintegrate after 40 days. They were right. Louis and his army left on August 1st after dutifully completing the mandatory six weeks. The remaining crusaders were far outnumbered by the revitalized southerners. The restoration of Count Raymond's authority did not take place overnight, but occurred steadily during 1220 and the first half of 1221. To further worsen morale, the Fifth Crusade was failing, causing troubadours to criticize the False Crusade for killing Christians in France rather than supporting crusaders against the Sultan. While the nobles of the Landoc slowly regained their estates, or what was left of them after more than a decade of warfare, the merchants were still not welcome at the great fairs on the Rhone and in Champagne, since Honorius threatened interdict or excommunication on anyone who dealt with the heretics. Still, the Cathars emerged from their hiding places to slowly re-establish their centers. The established church had linked itself to the northern invaders and now faced the consequences. As Montfort's son steadily lost his inheritance, the leaders of the church, including Bishop Fouque, found that they were not welcome and had to go into exile at Montpellier. 
However, people remained faithful and attended services given by local priests or donated to local monasteries. They just rejected the bishops. The crusade had sparked a religious change, or one had occurred alongside it. Domingo de Guzman had died in 1221, but his order of the friars preachers, the Dominicans, grew rapidly after his death. Together with the Franciscans, these preachers would grow to dominate religious thought in Europe. Most of the remaining leaders, including the Counts of Toulouse, the Count of Foix, and King Philip of France, happened to die of old age in 1222 and 1223. While Count Raymond had won back most of his lands, he remained excommunicated and was denied a Christian burial, so the war was now being fought by Raymond's son Raymond and Montfort's son Amari, both 25 years old. Desperate to have some form of successful resolution, a new papal legate, Conrad, convinced Amari to offer his dominions to Philip, enabling the Capetians to expand their territory, which should have been an irresistible offer, but Philip refused, thinking it was a dangerous extension. When Louis succeeded his father in July 1223, his only involvement in the crusade was a generous donation of 10,000 marks since he was initially occupied ensuring that his reign was secure. Having run out of money and men, Amari made an agreement with the Counts of Toulouse and Foix on January 12, 1224, where he surrendered Carcassonne, Minerve, and Pen d'Agenais, as well as agreed to return to northern France. Carcassonne was a critical loss since it had been the headquarters of the crusade for the past 14 years. The Counts of Toulouse, Foix, and Tranqueville returned to their lands, and it seemed that the crusade was finally over, after 15 long, blood-soaked years. Unfortunately, papal legate Cardinal Romano was uninterested in peace, so he responded to the Count's peace proposal with an excommunication. The southern bishops were also strongly opposed to reconciliation with Raymond, likely worried that they would lose many of their properties. Fearing that the crusade would be a complete failure and that heretics would be free to worship in peace, the Pope urged Louis to join the crusade. Louis responded by holding a council at Bourges on November 30th, 1225, where 40 archbishops, 113 bishops, and 150 abbots debated the conflicting claims of the two would-be counts of Toulouse. To no one's surprise, the council decided in favor of Amari, and the sentence of excommunication against Raymond was reaffirmed on January 28th, 1226. Amari promptly handed over his claim to Toulouse to Louis, giving him a reason to go on crusade. The timing was perfect for Louis, since the lords of the Landoc were broke and exhausted. Moreover, the French had taken La Rochelle and part of Poitou, so they no longer feared an English invasion taking advantage of their distraction in the south. Sixteen-year-old King James of Aragon was busy dealing with independent-minded barons in Aragon and Catalonia, so he chose not to interfere when the Capetians invaded Toulouse. In late May 1226, Louis led a huge army that faced little resistance as it moved south. Even proud Avignon chose not to fight, simply requesting that Louis lead his army around the city to avoid the inevitable destruction caused by a marching army. Since Avignon officially paid homage to the German emperor, this was a dangerous situation that required delicate handling. Louis agreed, but there was a misunderstanding somewhere and the Avignonese attacked. The exact cause is unclear, but Louis became enraged and laid siege to the city. To his surprise, he found himself bogged down in a siege of the city throughout the summer as the heat made life miserable for the besiegers. Many died from disease and famine rather than crossbow bolts. Others simply left. The Count of La Marche, the Duke of Burgundy, and Count Theobald of Champagne concluded that they had fulfilled the time requirements to earn a papal indulgence and returned home. Fed up with the siege, Louis ordered an assault, which was bloody, and the dead included his close friend, the Count of Saint-Paul. Worse, the English had taken advantage of Louis's preoccupation at Avignon to attack La Rochelle, which may have been why the councils at Avignon decided to resist. Eventually, the councils negotiated a surrender on September 9th, where they handed over their weapons and hostages, but avoided the city being sacked. Still, it had become too cold to besiege Toulouse, so Louis returned home in late October, intending to restart the siege in the spring. But he died of dysentery on November 8th on the way home, leaving a 12-year-old as an heir. Louis's death should have finally ended the crusade, but his widow Blanche was an able, 
determined woman with a fierce piety. Taking the extermination of heretics seriously, she named papal legate Romano her main advisor. Louis had given command of the crusade to his cousin Humphrey, who ravaged all of the territory around Toulouse. Crops, forests, and towns were eradicated. The destruction was performed with remarkable organization, as crossbowmen screened the workers and the knights escorting them in case the southerners broke through the crossbowmen. The systematic elimination of Raymond's economic base took three months. The strategy of ravaging the enemy's lands was not new, but this was an especially large-scale application, and effective, since a stream of counts and lords bent the knee. Raymond started negotiations in January 1229, and a final peace was agreed in the Treaty of Paris on April 12th. The Troncavel family lost all of their lands. Raymond himself had to beg for absolution from the papal legate in Paris in front of a royal audience. Although he was allowed to remain count, his daughter Joan, his only heir, would have to marry King Louis's brother Alphonse de Poitiers, and if they did not have children, Toulouse would become a crown possession. In addition, Raymond had to actively root out heresy and support the Inquisition. Much of his lands were given to the church, cutting the size of his domain in half. Finally, Count Raymond was whipped in Notre Dame Cathedral 20 years after his father had suffered a similar humiliation. Aside from a victory over the Counts of Toulouse, the Church moved to strengthen its control over society. The Synod of Toulouse in 1229 forbade the reading of the Bible in any language other than Latin, even though the majority of Europeans did not understand Latin. Unlike the Greek Orthodox Church, which translated the Bible into many languages in order to reach prospective converts in their own language, the papacy guarded carefully its role as the sole communication channel between believers and the Bible. While the Capetians had gained to lose, the Cathars continued to preach. Innocent's nephew, Pope Gregory IX, had learned from his uncle's mistakes. Gregory recognized that the previous approach of having bishops carry out purges of heretics was inefficient. The bishops were either corrupt, or unwilling to target relatives and friends for burning, or they did not share the papacy's definition of heretics, or the heretics would simply hide until the bishops grew tired. Determined to achieve visible results across Europe, Gregory ordered a general inquisition in March 1233, giving the task to the Dominicans, who embraced their nickname, the Hounds of God. The type of men who wanted such authority proved to be sociopaths, who happily sent hundreds, possibly thousands, to fiery deaths at the stake. Actually, the zealotry was financially lucrative. Anyone who betrayed a heretic received a cash bounty, paid from Count Raymond's treasury, while the heretic's property was divided among the informer, the church, and the crown. So it was both profitable and enjoyable, if you enjoyed burning harmless people with different thinking. The inquisitors were relentless, organized and ruthless. Suspects were not informed of the suspected crimes or the identity of their accuser, questioned for as long as the inquisitor desired. Any lawyer who helped would be accused of heresy, and since the inquisitor was prosecutor, judge, and jury, there was no appeal. Functioning as a secret police, the inquisition destroyed the bonds of community, as people were rewarded for informing on neighbors, friends, merchants, or even relatives. When an inquisitor arrived in a town or a village, every male over 14 and every female over 12 was required to publicly profess orthodox belief. Anyone suspected of insincerity would be pressured to name names, enabling the inquisition to compile lists of Cathars and their sympathizers. Given the financial rewards, the temptation to inform on a business rival, a romantic rival or anyone must have been irresistible. Possessing a love of burning flesh and no limits to their authority, the Inquisitors soon committed such excesses that both Count Raymond and Queen Blanche, Regent of France, wrote to the Pope to restrain the Dominicans. Pope Gregory may not have cared about those excesses, but he did care about German Emperor Frederick II, who opposed papal control over cities around the Mediterranean. Desperate for allies, Gregory was willing to make token efforts to restrain his zealous inquisitors. Men who would seize on the slightest deviation from orthodoxy as an excuse to light a bonfire would not take the hint and ease up. 
Instead, they accused several consuls of Toulouse of heresy in the fall of 1235. In response, the Dominicans were driven out of the city by a mob, clearly permitted by the count and the consuls. Reaching safety at Carcassonne, the friars promptly excommunicated the count and the consuls and placed the city of Toulouse under interdict. The Pope lifted the interdict and sent the inquisitors back to Toulouse, but confined himself to a sternly worded letter to Raymond. While the friars had to tread carefully in Toulouse, they abandoned any restraint anywhere else, and that relentless lack of mercy fueled resentment in the Landoc. Hoping to ride that wave of resentment to regain his lands, Raymond Trancaville, son of the Viscount who had died in Montfort's dungeons, raised an army of exiles in Aragon and besieged Carcassonne in 1240. However, his siege failed, and he renounced his claim to Carcassonne. Believing it was too risky, Count Raymond had stayed out of the fight. Two years later, he had nothing to lose since he had been unable to obtain the annulment he needed to remarry and hopefully produce a son. So he decided to revolt, but only after he had won allies, Henry III of England and Hugh of Lusignan. The revolt began on May 22nd, 1242, and Raymond had regained his lands by the end of the summer. However, he was let down by his ally Henry, who was supposed to land with an invasion force to retake Poitou, thus ensuring that the French crown would be too busy to punish Raymond. Unfortunately, Henry's barons had little interest in Poitou and refused to serve, so Henry's tiny force was quickly crushed. Grasping the situation, Hugh changed sides and joined the French. Aware that the French would torch everything that had been rebuilt, the Count of Foix stunned Raymond and made peace with France in the fall. Even though both his mother and his aunt had been Cathars, he joined the people who had slaughtered their fellow believers. Raymond managed to negotiate a treaty in January with a Surprisingly mild punishment, because King Louis knew that he would soon receive Toulouse, so why damage it? By this time, the sole remaining Cathar refuge was Montségur, a fortified village high in the mountains. More than 200 perfect had settled there, living their lives of denial while crafting goods to earn their keep. In the spring of 1243, a large army gathered below Montségur. Despite the size of the army, it could not encircle the refuge, and the terrain made siege engines impossible. Although the village had only 98 defenders, the siege dragged on through the summer and fall. Attacks were made as knights and soldiers clambered up goat paths but were driven off. Time was the real enemy, since food supplies gradually ran out. The lengthy siege drained the morale of the attackers as well, so shortly before Christmas, a group of Gascon men volunteered to scale a cliff face in the darkness, enabling catapults to be winched up. Even so, the village held out until March 2nd, 1244. Again, the terms were surprisingly lenient, since this was clearly the end of the Cathars as an organized religion. The surviving lay people were permitted to leave, although they would have to undergo a complete interrogation by the Inquisition. The 200 perfect were given two weeks to consider renouncing their faith, but none did, even though they could see men preparing the wood for the bonfires. In fact, 21 lay believers chose to join the perfects. So, on March 16th, the fires were lit and the stench of burning flesh and religious zealotry rose into the air. The conquest of the last Cathar stronghold signaled the end of the faith. Without a geographical center, perfects were alone, hunted as the number of safe houses dwindled through betrayals. The Inquisition grew rapidly as an institution, and its meticulous approach made it the original secret police. The Inquisitors relied on a cross-reference compendium of confessions dragged out from tens of thousands of people, pouncing on any error in a suspect's statements, and everyone was suspect. One of the leading inquisitors, Bernard de Cot, earned the nickname the Hammer of the Heretics, and he drew on his experience and the experience of his fellow inquisitors to draft the Manual of the Inquisitors of Carcassonne. The Inquisition signaled the transformation of Europe into a closed society. Previously, Christian thinkers could mingle with Jewish and Muslim thinkers in Toledo, Milan, Montpellier, Naples, and Palermo, but following the spread of the Inquisition, ideas from outside Christianity were viewed as heresy, so intellectual curiosity would be confined to Oxford, Brussels, Cologne, and Basel, with Paris as the center. 
The rejection of alien ideas was broadly applied, so contact with Muslims, Jews, and the Eastern Church were all forbidden. The Inquisitor's work became even easier in May 1252 when Pope Innocent IV gave the friars permission to employ torture, although they preferred to call it putting the question. At the same time, the Pope expanded their reach, allowing them to operate in Italy since Cathars had fled to Lombardy, Venezia, and Tuscany, taking advantage of the constant struggle between the German Emperor and the Pope. However, the exiles found fewer recruits and the belief gradually dwindled. Alphonse inherited Toulouse when Raymond died, but he was frail and hated traveling, so he spent most of his time in Paris. But his authority was executed by royal officials who steadily ended all of the concessions that had been won from previous counts. Many castellans and petty lords lost their authority and lands. The officials crushed any rebellious lords, establishing royal control to a degree that the counts of Toulouse could have only dreamed of. In fact, the Landoc became extremely prosperous once it had recovered from the devastation of the crusade. However, the increased prosperity and growth of urban centers was not due to the crusade, which had simply weakened the existing interconnected web of feuding counts and barons enough to enable the Capetians to impose royal control. Without the crusades, there might have been even more town communes, which would have fostered increased trade and gradually surpassed the feuding counts and barons, at least the weaker ones, by depriving them of revenue and being too large to attack. Without the crusade, Toulouse, or at least parts of the Landoc, might have moved closer into the influence of Barcelona, not Paris. Instead, a region with its own culture and language became subservient to Paris. So, the legacy of the Cathar Crusade is mass murder to eliminate a non-violent sect of Christians, the subjugation of an independent region of France, and the creation of a secret police that stamped out any foreign ideas. That was depressing to research. Glad it is done. Thanks for listening.